Welcome to 20 Minutes of Clarity. I'm your host, Jason Noble, and joining me today is our co-host, the Andy the Man Merchant. <laughs> How are you doing today, Andy? Hey, it's, uh, it's, a be- it's a beautiful day here in Wichita. So, uh, you know, and, and podcast land, uh, 20 Minutes of Clarity land. That's what we're going to start to referring to this, uh, this area. I love it. It's a good <laughs> land to be in. And we're going to talk about a crucial aspect of financial planning, wealth and lifestyle protect protection. Like specifically, we want to explore how the <laughs> lack of liquidity can impact your long-term financial plans. Now, Andy, you know, this, this, is, this is such an important topic, but like, why did we want to have this conversation today? And, and what's the catalyst that inspired mm-hmm. us to have it? You know, um, it's really about the fact that if our clients uh, don't have the the proper liquidity and planning, all the stuff we've done to this this point in their in their financial journey, right? That it it does it it can't be implemented. You know, nobody wants to be restrained. Nobody wants to have to be forced um, to sell a property or forced to borrow money at at an in, you know kind of an unfavorable uh, rate or have to work longer because they don't have the flexibility. So really, the highlight of today's the importance of today's is if you don't have the proper liquidity planning in place, you know, you could be forced to sell assets at a certain point in time. And nobody wants to be the, the, the child that has to sell the business or sell the farmland because mom and dad didn't plan for taxes. Right. You know, or you don't want to sell a stock when the markets are down. So we don't like forced selling. Um, yeah. We don't like people um, missing out on opportunities. You know, if you don't have the cash and a great opportunity, whether it's that dream home, uh, that ability to send your kid to college uh, of their dream or whatever it may be, buy their first car. You know, liquidity is so important of that. And then the other ones that I'll highlight real quick and we'll chime over um, is that we want people to be max flexible. Liquidity limits your flexibility. Um, and we don't want people to have, you know, the lack of that. So that's why we're talking about today is it's a huge part of financial planning is making sure you're protecting your wealth by having proper liquidity. Well, wealth and lifestyle protection involves that strategy to ensure that your financial assets and your standard of living are safeguarded against unforeseen events. And that unforeseen event implies it's a negative event. No, it could be a positive event, like a, like yeah. a capital call or opportunity or an investment yes. opportunity. It could be, right? But it just goes into, you know, these unforeseen events. How do you make sure that your standard of living is still able to navigate through that. And this can in, include, and not limited to, to in, uh, like insurance policies, emergency funds, and even your investment strategies. Like how, how quickly can you access these different types of uh, 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 pools of money, so to speak, so that you could be able to do accomplish the things that you need to accomplish and not derail your financial future. You know, and we could kind of break it down from there, Andy. Is there one that you feel that the listener should be able to to gravitate towards first as a problem? Yeah, I think I yeah, no, I think this is I think the biggest one, and we've got some studies on it, but I think we really just need to go to the basics and talk about the importance of of emergency funding. Um, you know, it's unique to it's the unique to everybody. Everybody defines emergency funding in a different way. But I think we just jump right in and, and let's just talk about First and foremost, why is it important um, to have an emergency fund and maybe some guidelines around what some of that emergency funding should be? Yeah, generally speaking, when you're going through, like meeting with most financial advisors, they will say three to six months. And where does that really weigh if you should be three versus six? Think about your own personal financial situation. If you're, if you're single and you have no children, uh, maybe three months, right? If you are married, and you have children closer to six months. <clears throat> However, also think about your job that you have. If you have variability in your income, mm. uh, you would may you would want to go even higher than six months, potentially nine to twelve months. Now, when I say these months, I want to be very clear. Now, not okay. Take some pen and paper and write this down. It's not months of income. It's your expenses. Like mm-hmm. you could be making like eight thousand dollars a month of income, but if you're spending let's say five thousand dollars a month on like living life and doing the things that you want to be doing, okay, then it's three to six months times five, okay, <laughs> not times eight. And 
when you have it, when you do it by like your income, not your expenses, now you have idle cash. That's not really doing anything for you, right? Mm -hmm. You want to tell your soldiers where to go fight and not have them just sit around and getting fat and lazy. Okay. Now think about what I just said, your soldiers, your money, you are the general. You want to tell your soldiers where to go. Okay. Instead of finding out where they went, but tell a, a few of your soldiers, not all 8,000 soldiers per month, tell 5,000 of them you're going over here. Okay. Yep. And you do that. You build up your emergency savings and it could take time, but you got to start somewhere. But once you hit the number that is right for you, this is where then you then take that extra money and you start putting it into long-term investing. So you don't want to have it too allocated. So like Andy, like pick me up where I left off, right? Yep. Like how, how would you tell someone three versus six, nine or 12 based off their expenses? How would you tell them to kind of use as a rule of thumb? What should they could be considering? Yeah, it's, well, it's the common, it's the common financial, uh, uh, term. It depends. Um, you know, it's getting bad on that, but we say it a lot. Uh, no, it's it really boils down, right, Jason? We've talked so much for those that have been listening and viewing and following us for some time is that we have this the, the Clear Picture Wealth Program and the analysis that helps identify a lot of things. But um, but more importantly, it's, it's how we help implement that strategy for those that become a client. So we're kind of taking a little shift um, beyond just getting, you know, taking advantage and, and signing up and, and doing the Clear Picture Analysis Test. But how do we actually start to implement and build? And when I say it depends, you highlighted a number of really key features in there. It's like, look at your income force. How, what's the, what's the, you know, the variability of it or the volatility of it? One of the common questions or the questions we ask in the, in the analysis and implementation is, what, you know, on a scale of like kind of low to mid to high volatility, where do you rank your income? You know, if you're in the real estate business and real estate has now rate, risen to the rates that it has, it's slowed a bit, um, you know, you need to have some of that emergency fund. So that could be a component. You know, the other component we look into is what is your current debt? If you already have a big debt ratio um, that we're going to support to have a little bit more emergency fund, because one thing that we all know is that if you still owe debt, even if you don't have income, the debt still do. Um, you know, you can't refinance things. You can't do things like that. So we really want to make sure that we have that. And then the other one is that if you're in a, maybe have some unplanned for expense exposure, you know, you could have an aging parent, a child that's about to go to school um, or get a car or, or just some kind of expenses like, eh, we haven't really planned for it. It may or may not happen, um, but you're gonna, you're, you need to be there. You know, if you have rentals or, or if you have some other, other assets that could spark up, you might want to keep a little bit more. Um, so it's really about understanding that first and under having a real understanding of your cash flow, which if you haven't checked it out, go back. We have we have past episodes, an entire theme on cash flow. It'll help you understand that. But that's really the basis of what we do um, in order to have emergency funding so that clients don't get um, get stuck with a spike of of expenses that are greater than their income and rely on having to rely on credit cards or additional loans or stopping their savings plan. Um, that's the importance of of where we go with it from there. And yeah. if you're liking what Andy and I are talking about, right, and you're seeing value, go ahead and subscribe so that you could get future content. Go back and see what Andy was referring to within cash flow analysis, because we went deeper into that than we are going to today. But like, this is where you could like, you could then subscribe and then be stay informed so that you can make better informed financial decisions. So we talked about emergency savings. What's another thing that we should be considering when it comes to the importance of liquidity? Yeah, I uh, the one that I like a lot that we talk to is, and this will be a quick one, um, is it it is having proactive access to credit. Um, this might be speaking more to to our our clients and our and ours that are listening that are nearing or in retirement. Um, you know, a lot of times we try to work really hard to get rid of debt. Um, and when I say access to credit, I'm talking about good credit. You know, if you think about your home, your home has a built-in piggy bank of equity. Um, that you may want to be able to access at some point, usually have some preferred treatment or, or terms in comparison to like a 25% credit card rate. Um, that, that's hard to pay off in that case. But, uh, you know, Jason, a lot of times for our clients that are nearing or, or approaching retirement, um, we'll go ahead and put on a home equity line of credit. You know, those are 10-year 
usually term-based product, uh, 10 year, you know, draw periods, you get access to uh, the equity in your home for those emergency funds that may be better than paying taxes or taking a drawdown during a market volatility cycle. So having access to credit, if you're young and accumulating assets, that's another thing is, is put it on there when it's appropriate, um, but, but have proper spending restraints and, and understanding that it's really kind of tied to that emergency fund. So I think getting access to credit um, is so important for, for people to do, but keep proactive, um, work with your banker is my big one. Well, yeah, we have the access to the home equity line of credit through the home within certain portfolios and strategies that you have a taxable account or a trust account like you could even do a line of credit against the portfolio yeah and and when you're working with a professional the professional understands this the professional is able to manage the risk paradigm on those strategies they have to it's a very key component so that you could get the proper leverage. So you're not drawing down the investments, you're using the collateral, you're using the line of credit instead. So then you're able to get that back. And like sometimes those rates could be very competitive to the home equity line of credit as well. So it's just, how do you get access to credit in an event like that? So then I go into the second part of that, Andy, that I'm going through in my mind, I just want to have you talk through it is okay so you you take money out of the home equity line of credit while the market is pulling back and your portfolio is down when do you start putting money back into that home equity line of credit so that you're not carrying on that interest too long yeah that really is going to depend on on what your access line is you know if you're proactive enough i mean uh, you know this podcast is about giving real life stories with but protecting the innocence uh you know we were proactive for all of our clients. this is what we do as the implementation why i said that is that a lot of our clients back in late 2021, we knew, right? Because where were rates at still in 21? They're still pretty low. But we we did have some some you know of the of the um, tickler going off, or some of our, our indicators are saying that rates will probably start to rise. We just never know how quick or how quick they were going to rise. But we started locking in. So we work with local banks. We found a very attractive fixed home equity line product, which is hard to find, but we found one. Um, locked it in, get this, Jason, we locked it in for this particular set of client data for three years. So we had a fixed rate at three and a half percent. So we were able to use their home equity line at a lower rate. And if you remember 2022, what happened, rates started going up, bond values went down, which bonds are generally our first line of access to income and cash flow. Uh, they let the equities be the growth bucket, right? Um, but that didn't work. Markets were down, bonds were down, cash flow still needed to be, so we borrowed from their home. To answer your question is now what we started to do is that markets rebounded, uh, the bond values got back up to, to about their break even point, but equities took off. So we're now just slowly having kind of an amortization schedule to pay that down. But every year, Jason, I'll say this, is I look at it and say, is there arbitrage in the, in the scenario? Meaning, can I make more money than what our borrow rate is? So keep in mind what I said, we borrowed money fixed for three and a half percent. We were, the markets over the last, what, 18, 20 months have given us significantly more than that. So we're making more than what our borrow cost is. So I'm at no hurry at that point in time to pay it down, um, but we will be coming close to when those, uh, those dates will adjust. So it's important to know that it, you have to create a strategy around it. But if your advisor is not being proactive with strategies around your cash flow like that, um, I'm telling you right now, clearpicturefinancial.com is the best place to go um, because our advisors are, and we want to start with the need. But uh, I hope that addressed your question. But I think it's it's a uh, it's important to know how to get out of it once you get in it. Some some key takeaways that I have, uh, and also to share with the listeners because you share a lot of great stories, Andy. And it's there's two things really. It's one making sure you have a regular review and update of your financial plan. And the other one is avoid high interest debt and have a strategy for managing the debt that you have, right? And so if you have this low interest debt and you're able to arbitrage it, yeah, you're not rushing to pay that low interest debt off, but you do eventually want to address, you don't want to just linger it out there. But then also on the other side of it, if you have, <clears throat> if you, if you did not have a proper plan in place to be proactive in this decision, and then you had to tap into credit card debt, something like that, because you just didn't have the emergency savings or access to credit. Well, no, you're paying 25, 30% on interest. 
no, you don't have that luxury of of arbitrage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the the credit card company does. Believe me, they're using it. No, no. What Andy's talking about is flipping the script on the financial system, so you're keeping more money in your pocket. Less is going not just Uncle Sam, but less is going over to the banks as well. Well, we might add, Jason, as we kick to the next one, uh, the next thought I have is, you know, also access to credit means being efficient and optimal in, in reducing your current debt so that you have more access to credit, right? So those that have that are listening that might say, hey, I've got a little bit more credit card debt. We know inflation's, you know, kind of tight in the belt right now. It's making a lot of people rely on alternative borrowing methods. But if your credit card debt's a little higher, um, that's another thing we look at and what we implement is we try to find a way that if I've got twenty, thirty thousand dollars of bad debt out there, is there a way that we can structure it to make that bad debt onto better debt and then free up that liquidity so you have more access? Because once you get tapped to the brim, there's nothing you can do. We have a challenge and, for the listeners. Every time we say debt, okay, you gotta <laughs> mark that in your in your form fill or you gotta hit another like. Okay. Yeah. No, let's move on to the next one. What about leveraging insurance insurance? Yep special types of insurance to help you navigate this yeah. event as well. Yeah, and we've got a whole, you know, a whole, again, a whole series on just uh, protecting income and those things. But I just want to highlight, I think the important part of liquidity is, is you know, obviously life insurance um, is a good way to save your family, right? In the event that, um, that you pass and you need to have sustained liquidity for them, meaning cash flow. I think we've, we've kind of talked to that, you know, Jason, obviously chime in, but I think the other side of liquidity um, that we need to talk about that protection is having proper coverage and disability coverage, um, you know, and other health coverages. Because if if you lose income, I've got a client right now had a stroke, wasn't obviously planning on a stroke. Um, you know, there's going to impact their working income. They still had a couple, three, four, five years to work, um, but now disability is at least picking up to continue to pay the bills. We've got time now because they had the right disability coverage in place um, to ensure. So again thinking about the volatility of your income determines how much maybe disability protection you need and the type of assets you have. But if you're not using that leverage of life insurance, it's so important um, from ca from that capacity. Um, so that's my big thing. What do you have to add, Jace? Yeah, just again, just to add, not, not a uh, repeat, but to add as it's going into, you have in certain policies, a cash value built in within the policy that you could touch without paying taxes on that money. And you could touch up to a certain amount before it becomes a problem, right? So every mm -hmm. single policy is designed uniquely, but if you could touch that money and if it's enough, you could take care of the unforeseen event and then you could have the policy recoup it or you could put money back into the policy to get it recouped it, it could work either way depending on how you touch it and like part of my retirement income certified professional designation with professor wade fowl was using whole life insurance policy or policies like index universal life policies that have like a built-in accumulation value to be able to use that as a second factor within retirement income meaning markets on the public markets go down, you have this other pool of money that you could use. And, and so you're not having to sell the money when it's in a down market. Mm -hmm. uh, so like there's all those different <clears throat> things that really come into play. And here's the thing, it's an arrow that you have in your quiver if you have that type of policy, why not be able to take advantage of it if needed? No, there's advisors out there that will say buy term and invest the rest. I'm not saying that that is wrong, I am saying right now here today, it's wrong for absolutely everybody to do that. You know, and then, well, we never do this. Whoever says that to you is not a fiduciary and they're not looking at what's in your best interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? To say we never or we always, with everybody, those two things are, are, are not acceptable in our offices, Andy. And the other thing, the other word that's not acceptable is typical. We typically do this or we typically do that. Nope. Those those words do not fly in our offices. That's why we use depends because <laughs> so, it depends on the situation. Right. But uh, hey, as we wind down on this, Jason, too, I mean, and I know you'll take us away. Great. But the last thing I want to say, and this is really for our farm families, our ag families, our, our our family legacy asset clients, is that here's the thing that we work with so much in my office, Jason, because we have so many farm communities around us is having the proper protection in place so that you don't have to fire sale an asset 
because you don't have the proper liquidity planning. I see too many farm families, right, that they, they know this. If you're listening and viewing this, you know it today. You're considered asset rich, cash poor. And what happens is, is that when you have to pay the taxes that you're passing, um, there's usually a tax bill due at some level, right? Whether it's paying off debt, um, because we know you farmers, we, we leverage debt, we, you understand it. Um, but if you have debt or if you're one of those families that happens to be above the estate tax limits, if you don't have cash, how do you pay for it? That's kind of my final topic is that you've got to have a plan, protect your wealth. You've worked so hard to earn it. Um, don't let it just go out the back door because you had lack of liquidity planning, which is all something you can control. And that's the big part of the Clear Picture Wealth Program is putting you in control. Well, that was another episode of 20 Minutes of Clarity. <laughs> I'm your host, Jason Noble, and that was Andy Merchant. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.